name is Elisa Stewart. I'm from the Department of Plant Science at the Faculty of Science at Mahinon University. I am an ecologist and most of my research focuses on plant pollinator interactions. I started working on nectar bats first and the plants that they pollinate and then over the years I've started working on other pollinators as well including bees. Most bat species eat insects, and so therefore they're very important for pest control. My research actually focuses on bat pollinators, so species that either only drink nectar or a mix of fruit and nectar. And these bats are so important for humans and the environment because they help pollinate many plant species. This is the farm that we're gonna be setting up our mist nets tonight. And the reason why we chose this location is because there are lots of banana plants that have banana flowers. So you can see from this inflorescence that at the top there's a bunch of baby bananas um, that are starting to grow. And then at the bottom there's a big red inflorescence. The red part is actually the bract Every evening, one of the red bracts will lift up and underneath it will be uh, several cream-colored flowers. The bats will land on the red bract and stick their noses inside, um, inside the flowers in order to get to the nectar. We set the nets up before it gets dark and then once the sun sets, we hope we'll catch some bats. All right, so we're ready to start putting up the mist nets at our site and I have with us Jerrica Jamison from a visiting PhD student from the University of Toronto and Piria Hassa from Department of Plant Science, Faculty of Science at Mahidon University. So we can take the nine meter net and I think if we run it right across the gully, uh, we can end it right by that palm frond and it should be good. Sounds good. So here are some of the bats that we've caught tonight and when we take them out of the net we put them in these breathable cloth bags and tonight we have gotten several species already. For example, um, this one is an Eonycterus belei or Lepgut. So the reason why we call it Lepgut is because here you can see he has a claw on his thumb but then he doesn't have a claw on his second digit, and that's why we call him Lepgut. He's a nectar bat that doesn't use echolocation. He uses mostly vision, so he's got really large eyes. He has a really long tongue for getting nectar. You can see the tip of his tongue sticking out. So we can take a look at this bat. This is another nectar bat. This one is Macroglossus sabrinus. The Thai name is this one is a specialist on banana flowers because it's a nectar bat. It has a very long snout, very long muzzle, and a very long tongue. You can see the tip of the tongue sticking out. <laughs> you can see he has very tiny teeth, but very sharp teeth. This one has a claw on his second digit. This is, this is normal among most of the bats in this family. We also caught one insect-eating bat in our nets and we usually don't catch that many. There's many species of insect-eating bat in Thailand. So you can see for insect-eating bats, they typically have very tiny eyes and relatively large ears, and that's because they rely on echolocation to navigate. 
and they don't really use their eyes at all, um, but their ears are very sensitive. This is quite different from the nectar bats that we saw earlier because the nectar bats like Eonycteris and Macroglossus, they have much larger eyes and their eyes are very sensitive and they have relatively small and simple ears because they aren't relying on echolocation the way that the insect bats do. So this bat is Sinopterus brachiotis and the tie name is Kapu Kaulik. And all of the bats in this genus have white rimmed ears, which is how they got their tie name. And you can see, so this bat is in the same family as Eonycterus and Macroglossus but you can see that this one has a much shorter snout and that's because this one primarily forages on fruit and only visits flowers occasionally. So it has uh, very powerful jaws for biting into fruits, but it has a much shorter muzzle and a much shorter tongue because it hasn't evolved to be specialized on flowers. So the first thing that we do is we want to weigh the bat. We'll weigh it when it's in the bag and then we'll weigh the bag alone so that we can get the measure, we can subtract the weight of the bag to get the measurement of the bat. 84 grams, including the weight of the bag. This, this bag weighs 27 grams. So we know that the weight of the bat is 84 minus 27. And then we also take a forearm measurement, 66.85 millimeters. And the next thing that I do is I like to take pollen from the fur just so that we can see what flowers he's been visiting. This is a gel that has a pink dye in it that stains the pollen grains. So I can take a little bit of gel from the syringe and run it through the bat's fur. Sometimes, or often what I'll do is I'll take pollen from different areas of the bat because different flowers put deposit pollen on different areas of the bat. So I also often will take a sample from the bat's chest. Also, uh, take a sample from the wing. And then that's all for this bag, and then he goes back in his bag. So, we can take a lighter, and this will just melt the, or melt the gel. And once it cools, it'll harden into a gel again, and then we can look at it under a microscope and identify what pollen the bat is carrying. This is typically what we do when we catch bats in the field, and I will take these slides back to the lab and look at them under a microscope in order to identify the pollen species that different bat species carry. ความรู้ทำให้ทุกอย่างเป็นไปได้มหาวิทยาลัยมหิดลปัญญาของแผ่นดิน